Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Be the Competitive Edge, with my very special guest, James Bristow. Woohoo! So hey. excited about this. <laughs> So come on in, everyone. Tell us where you're from. Oh, we've got Germany. Wow. Kansas, Washington, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Texas. And I imagine some of you in the Midwest and East are starting to feel the, the fall effects. We've been starting to feel it here. So come on in. Say hello. We're very, very happy that you're here today. We're going to have an awesome discussion with James. So first of all, in case you don't know me, I am Joan Burge. I'm the founder and CEO of Office Dynamics International. We are a global leader in the development and presentation of sophisticated training programs and information for administrative office professionals. And we have been doing this for 32 years. Woohoo! Um, so I'm going to give you a few logistics and then I am going to introduce James in a few minutes and tell you about our goals for today. So the learning part of this session will be about 40 to 45 minutes and then we'll go to Q&A. You can put your questions in the chat anytime throughout the program or you can wait until later and Malia will gather those throughout our session and then Malia will help facilitate with the questions. If you have any technical issues, the only support we can give you is through the chat and you will get a replay link of today's session. So let me tell you about my very good friend and colleague, James Bristow. Oh, I'm so excited. We love James. He is the co-author of our new book, The Executive's Competitive Edge, Why You Need to Leverage the Time and Talents of an executive assistant. Uh, we've been on a really exciting journey, you know, with our book over this past year. Very quickly, how we met and how we got to this book is James and I belong to a CEO group. We had joined several years ago and we met each other. Uh, it was a Las Vegas, what well, was international, but we belong to the Las Vegas chapter. And James and I hit it off right away, even though we're 30 years apart age-wise. Wow. But our minds, we are on the same path when it comes to our administrative assistants, our executive assistants, and this whole idea of having a partnership with you and the value that we place on you and your roles. Um, James, right now, his full-time work, he's managing partner of Universal Engineering Sciences, he is now responsible for expanding the Western division of the nation's fastest growing engineering firm. So he has a massive job, big job. He's never around. He's always on the go. And I know he is very grateful for his EA, who is right now off for two weeks, and he's pulling his hair out <laughs> without her. Um, but as we said, we are firm believers in this partnership. Today, what we want to talk about are the benefits you derive when you are the edge. So first of all, the book is about your executives having a competitive edge when they have a strong partnership with their assistant. Today, I kind of want to approach it from the other side of it is how you are the edge. And also we're gonna cover the signs that will let you know you are your leader's competitive edge. Now, uh, in terminology, we refer to executive. I know some of you though may use the term leader, manager, supervisor, whatever, but we're talking about that person that you support. You know, most often, and maybe some of you, you're supporting a few people, but we want to focus on the one that you provide the majority of your support to. So, um, James, first of all, welcome. Hi, hi, hi. Thank you. So happy you are here. It's exciting. I'm uh, I'm watching the folks join in, and I saw even Miss Kayla uh, from vacation is is logged on. She said hello in there. So. Don't give her, you know, don't, 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 don't talk about me pulling my hair out too much. She's going to hear it. She, uh, she left me in good hands and she has uh, a good trainee and she's passed the torch a little bit. So I'm doing okay. I'm uh, reporting oh, good, today from good, our good. Phoenix, Arizona office. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, we're glad Kayla can chime in for sure. All right. So we're going to run through the benefits uh, 
rather quickly I am, and then it, James wants to add a few words to that because we want to actually get into the meat of the program for you. So what are the benefits you derive? These are the ones that came to my mind. When you provide the edge, you are viewed as working in partnership with management. Uh, you're, you're just at that higher level view. You are seen as, you know, like I said, they're partners. And when you are viewed that way, of course, you're going to be incorporated more into the business. Um, when you support, and James, I'll run through mine quickly. And then if you want to add anything, when you support your team in a way that gives them the edge, they value you. They need that. And they really, truly value your contributions. When you're, uh, I know this one for sure. When your leader looks good, you look good. <laughs> it is your team brand. You are viewed as a leader. You are privy to information that will help you do your job better. So when you're providing that edge to your executive, you're going to be brought more into the loop. As you're brought into the loop, now you have more knowledge. You're going to be exposed to more information, which then allows you to do a better job. And you build lifetime business skills. How I view this as, as an assistant and an executive is you know, when as an assistant, you're providing that edge. Well, you're growing skills yourself to provide the edge. Those are skills you will take with you the rest of your life, no matter what you do and where you go. So, James, those are my quick thoughts. Yeah, I think probably the the, the most important element of becoming the competitive edge is, is, is really twofold. So the first is you have a trusting relationship with your executive or your partner. Um, and that trust has to be built on, you know, spending a lot of time together and, and working towards common goals and working on strategy. Uh, and that kind of folds into the second piece. And that is working strategically rather than tactically. And so when you and your executive are working strategically, meaning like big picture, um, visionary type things, not just in the, the weeds and the tactics, but working on the strategy, you really start to become the competitive edge because you simply put, you can move faster, you can move more efficiently, um, and you're making a higher impact in your organization. When 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 your executives partners come to them or their their C suite come to them and say, "How do you get so much done in a given day or in a given week?" It's mind blowing. Do you ever sleep? That's how you know that you're working together as a strategic team. Uh, with your strategic partner, because candidly speaking, the executive is not doing everything by themselves, but it makes it look like they just never sleep. And that's what uh, I love to hear from my partners. They're like, you know, do you ever sleep? And part of it is not really, but but part of it is also it's not just me. I have a strategic partner that has, that's a high impact strategic partner and gives me that competitive edge that I, that I need in our organization. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. All right, so um, I'm gonna throw this out really quick. I like to be a little spontaneous. For our audience, what do you think the benefits would be to you if you were that competitive edge? Do you have any other thoughts besides what James and I said? I know it takes a minute for you to put it in the chat. So if you wanna add that, I would love to, to get your thoughts of the benefits you could see. All right, so while you're doing that, how do you know, how do you actually know, sitting there as that assistant, that you are that edge to your executive? Okay, we have some benefits coming in, so I'll do that quick. Job satisfaction, being more effective, career advancement, very good, respect across the organization, adding value to the corporation, excellent ideas, career fulfillment, Okay, so we all agree, you know, there are many, many benefits to you being the edge. So how do you know it? The first one actually, and, and James just mentioned it. I think it was one of the first things we talked about, James, when we were working on the book. You And you went on a lot about the trust piece. So do you want to build on that um, context? And then I, I'll add a little bit. Yeah, I think the relationship has to, it has to be founded on a on a level of trust. And 
trust is is a is a tricky thing because y- you have to build it intentionally with with a goal in mind. And in our roles as executives, uh, you know, Joan, you, you've heard me say this before. You know, we're in a high risk, high reward kind of environment usually, and the amount of risk that we have sometimes makes it such that executives don't want to delegate. They don't want to pass things off because the risk of failure is high for them. And so if you can build trust first and foundationally build trust into your relationship with your executive assistant, you're well on your way to building a strategic partnership. So recognizing that you have to start intentionally with building trust and, and, and the ways that you know I like to build trust is spending time outside of the office um, together, call it breaking bread, right? Um, spending time eating together, spending time socializing together. I'm not talking about going to the bar, playing golf together, things like that necessarily. If your executive likes, likes to play golf and you do too, that's that's great. But finding things where you can weave the fibers of your personal relationship, um, an effective professional personal relationship together Uh, both in and outside the office, is foundational in that trust building. Also foundational in the trust building is sharing personal goals. So goal setting in and outside of the organization is really important. With my executive assistant, we share some of the goals that uh, we want to establish or, or, or hit inside and outside of the organization, and we help each other with those goals. So, you know, as you have those successes, you kind of reinforce the trust inside of the relationship. Uh, I saw a number of of comments around the benefits for the executive assistant uh, when you become that strategic partner or that uh, competitive edge. And you're right in that uh, as you as your executive is more successful in meeting their goals, in turn, you will as well. That's because it's a reciprocal symbiotic relationship, right? You've really hooked in to commonality in your goal setting. And that's foundational at the trust level. Wow. Uh, I always get so much out of you in a very short time. I also thought this uh, Herminia Jones said, um, or sorry, I'm, who said it? Herminia. Yeah, spending time with my executive's family is another way I've gained trust. I thought that was interesting because we, we typically wouldn't think of that maybe, you know, as that assistant. Um, And the other piece I just want to bring up with the trust is uh, I think a tendency for administrative professionals when we think of trust, we immediately go to confidential information. Mm -hmm. But I want to approach something else that I often hear with executives and I know I feel and James probably feels is we have to trust our assistants are going to follow through. So as that assistant, the way you are that edge is when you follow through on everything that is assigned to you and you follow up. And because once it leaves my hands, I don't want to have to think about it again, whatever that is. I'm going to trust that you did it. You made that call. You followed up and trust that you're going to come back to me and tell me where we are in the process. So, um, you know, that that's another phase of trust. It's not just confidential information. We entrust so much to you as that admin. So ensuring and where that goes to ensuring that you have excellent follow up systems, excellent note taking systems, that you don't lose track of the 101 things that your executive expects you to do. And when you do that, right, James, and and we see things are getting done. And then I also know when I see my assistants can handle or my assistant can handle certain things over time, I delegate more and more and, and bigger things, not necessarily just a bunch of little things, but I delegate assignments that actually have impact. Well, Joan, I think even more than that, like when you become that competitive edge, you're starting to think ahead. And so the delegation may not even actually physically have to happen. So once you have a trust built relationship and each person, each party or each group of people, if it's a group of executives or a management team that you support gets to a point where you mean what you say and you say what you mean and and people can count on each other to do what they say they're going to do, which, you know, like you said, you want to break trust, start there. That's the easiest way to break trust is not do what you say you're going to do, right? That's, That's functionally what trust is. 
But let, let's say that um, you're basically working together, mean what you say, say what you mean, and you're goal sharing. So you, you have a strategic objective, you've discussed it, the, the executive assistant and the executive have been working together to establish those goals. Eventually, what really reinforces trust and, and creates that competitive edge is when the executive assistant and strategic partner can preemptively make decisions or move the needle or create impact in a certain direction that is consistent with what the C-suite or, or manager is looking for. That is that is really powerful stuff when you can get to that point in the relationship because the trust is there, you've communicated effectively, and you're working together towards common goals. I've found that good executive assistants, good strategic partners may find out or make a decision even before the executive does because they're seeing the information earlier or maybe they're processing, processing, processing it quicker through a, a shorter filter or a shorter funnel. And so that's really powerful when you can work together to make those decisions faster, faster and more effectively. Excellent. Wow, that's really good. Yes, I like that. Preemptively move the needle. I made a note of that. <laughs> I like that verbiage. Um, so this kind of it leads to number two that I had on the list was maintaining the confidences. So obviously that is very important. Um, and, and as that edge and being an assistant and being privy to information. And I guess I brought this one in here because I did hear of a recent situation uh, from a CEO with an EA um, who I've been working with actually together and um, they were developing that relationship and then come to find out months later, she lost the position because she had overheard some things, uh, phone calls um, that the CEO was having and then divulged or shared some information, you know, with staff and maybe it wasn't intentional, but it's so that also ties into good judgment, right? James knowing what to share and what not to share. Yeah. You know, it's super important in, in our roles um, traditionally in, in management, we're privy to a lot of information um, and sometimes that information can break an organization. It can break a team. Um, you know, I just, you know, a really simple example is if, if the organization makes a decision that we have to uh, eliminate positions or lay people off and that information gets out too early, it can create a lot of HR issues. It can create a lot of legal issues or risk issues for the organization. So just a simple example that most organizations have to deal with at some point in time um, you can really get, get some problems for the, for the group. So, you know, you've got to stay focused on making sure communication and messaging is clean, concise, and directly between the executive assistant and the executive or executive team. It needs to stay there. And unless the team that has decided that the EA should be the leader of a certain line of communication, things really have to stop there. Uh, you know, the, uh, I use uh, my strategic partner like a sounding board. So even not even not even with a decision, I'll have four or five options. And in that conversation, my intent may not be to make a decision. I'm just bouncing things off of her and looking for some feedback for things I haven't thought of. And so that decision-making process can't get outside because those options that I haven't made a decision on are not real, right? So... It's, it's really important to make sure that those lips stay locked up. And in smaller offices, it can be even more detrimental. In big offices, the, the rumor mill can get going and that can be very damaging to the organization. So that confidentiality, that, that trust between um, those individuals on that executive team uh, is paramount. That's excellent. Thank you, James. Um, the third one, this is such a, a hot topic. I, I'm really getting intrigued with this and I just saw on article today too in Apple News about the decision fatigue phenomenon, how people are, um, and it was from a psychologist, how that people are totally exhausted and can't even make a decision about what clothes to wear today. Um, because just over the past two years, they've been taxed to the max. But I know, James, we talked about this 
earlier on, we talked about it too in, in conference two weeks ago, but relieving. So the third way you know you are that edge, helping give that edge to your executive is when you help relieve this, their decision fatigue by just making decisions on uncertain things. So if we think about it, executives make hundreds of decisions all day long, big and small, some that are very impactful. And so by the end of the day, it's easy for them and me included, you know, sometimes by the end of the day, I don't want to decide one more thing. I don't care how simple it is. You know, I'm just like, I'm done. I don't want to make any more decisions. So um, James, could you uh, talk on this really important subject? Yeah, decision fatigue is real. Um, I mean, my brain is running a, a million miles an hour with information and communication coming in from every angle possible at all times of the day. When I wake up in the morning, I've already got 100 emails in the morning, uh, you know, and a number of those need a need a decision. So, you know, today I was able to decide what socks to wear. I, I you know, I, I picked that. Um, so one's very successful decision. Uh, and sometimes I even struggle with a simple thing like what's what socks to put on. Um, what color socks, you know, and, and that's, it's a silly example that I like to use, but uh, um, it, it, the brain can, can get overwhelmed sometimes, especially when we're moving in a more virtual, more digital world with information coming in at a thousand miles an hour. So, it's helpful that once you've built trust and you have that strategic partnership that you're building uh, with common goals and with common communication and common language, that you get to a point where um, anyone on your team who can make decisions at their level that you're comfortable with, you should, as an executive, empower them to do so. So I strive to allow decisions to be made by my partners and recognize each time when they do that, I have to decide is the decision good enough? It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be what my brain thinks as perfect, but is it good enough? And, uh, you know, basically deciding, you know, did they make a powerful decision and does it move the organization forward? That's a, that's a really good partnership. It doesn't have to be exactly how I would make the decision, but ironically, as we strengthen that relationship with our executive and our executive assistant, those decisions start to look and sound like it were you making the decision. And that's how you know you're getting close. You're getting to that competitive edge where the team doesn't know the difference in who made, who made the decision. That's what you want to strive for. Mm, wow. So, James, I have a question too, thinking like as an assistant, that could be a little scary sometimes, right, for the assistant um, in taking on making those and I, I think you alluded earlier too to the um maybe it's the impact like if I, if that assistance having to make a decision about something and that fear you know it's a risk what what kind of factors do they weigh in other words if if to me take that risk and step out there and you're maybe not going to do it perfectly every time as long as it doesn't impact a huge financial impact then have the courage to so yeah for them to have that courage to make a decision and maybe it won't always be right but isn't that how they're going to learn yeah look i'm not telling you to go make a decision that is not yours to make right there's layers of responsibility inside the matrix of those relationships and if you make the, a decision that's not yours to make that that is premature and you haven't built that trust that relationship you're going to get yourself in some hot water so i'm definitely not saying you do that but as you communicate with your executive or your or your executive team you will gain their trust and you will gain the autonomy and authority to make decisions. And my advice is that you stay on the edge of that. You stay on the front edge of that, meaning constantly push the boundaries. And if you have the perspective that your executive wants you to make decisions for them, they really do whether they say that or not. They don't want to make all these decisions. They may not even realize that they have decision fatigue yet, but stay on the front end of that and constantly push the envelope. The risk is actually not that that high. You're, you're just on the edge of where you're trying to do more. And if your intent is to help, your intent is to be kind in your relationship with your executive, then they'll see that and say, you know, even when you mess up, hey, I appreciate the fact that you were trying to help me there. 
not exactly how I would have done it. Do it this way next time instead. What you just did was next time, you know exactly what to do. You've just pushed the envelope so that you can keep going and, and help that executive. So, uh, you know, just constantly stay on the front edge of that. Wow, oh, that's great. Thank you so much. All right, um, we're on to number four. We actually have 10, by the way. <laughs> so I know James and I could talk about this forever, but uh, number four, be the accountability partner your executive needs. And uh, this is a great topic. Um, I always say sometimes we're our own worst enemy uh, as an executive. My example that I always think of is I'll say, all right, next Tuesday and Thursday, I'm blocking the entire day because I have to do writing and I need to be 100% focused. And I'm not going to take any calls. I'm not going to do anything but write. And then all of a sudden, maybe a business colleague will send me an email. Oh, we need to get together. We need to do this or that. And I'll be like, oh, well, next Tuesday I was going to write all day, but I guess I could take an hour and a half or two and we could have a business lunch. So I need Malia to say, come in and say, Joan, no, you do not give that away. You know you're going to be mad if you do that. You need that time. So that's one example I have as to how you kind of can be that accountability partner and hold your executive to the ground in what they say. Yeah, when Kayla and I huddle up, she'll ask me, what are the three things that we have to get done this week or this month or whatever? And we're talking about our goal setting and things. And she'll really hold me to it because, you know, as executives, who 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 is telling us what to do? If you're at the top of the organization and you have all of the authority to do whatever you want on any given day, who's going to hold our feet to the fire to get things done? Um, and, and frankly, we're probably the, the least responsible person in the organization from a mean what we say, say what we mean. I can change my mind on any given day and there's no repercussions. But when I've empowered my strategic partner just to hold me accountable to something, it's really awesome. And, and obviously you have to do it with tact. And you know, she's not coming in and saying, you know, you lied to, to yourself and, and pointing her finger at me. But she is saying, you know, hey, we've got to we've got to get that done because you said so. We've got to get it done. You said this was important. Let's let's hold uh, each other uh, accountable for it. And, and, you know, Joan, you and I have talked a lot about the fact that this that's why we wrote this book with the audience in mind of being the executive. We're the broken ones. We're the ones that need the training. You know, you have I'm looking at, you know, hundreds of individuals on this or on this group right now that have all the training that you've provided them, many of them, and they know exactly how they can help. But the executive doesn't. The executive needs to recognize that the power of a strategic partner needs to be unleashed for you to be able to get that full impact. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a darn shame for the industry at how few executives have really unleashed that power, the power of the strategic partner, the competitive edge. Yeah, thank you for bringing that out. And speaking of the book, someone just asked about the points I'm covering. Are they in the book? So actually, the points I'm covering are um, in the, the early part of the book, the chapter on um, the first chapter or part one. It's why you need an executive assistant. So we have heavily emphasized telling these executives and why you need an EA, first of all, because some of them think they don't need you. Uh, so this is where I'm pulling a lot of this from, why you need to have this person. We talk about the significance you bring to them. Then in the book, we get into um, what we talk about shifts that have taken place, tectonic shifts in the workplace. And then the important part, we have a part on how to build a strategic partnership with you, because like James said, they don't know what to do, most of them. And number four, part four I love is how to maximize the time and talents of an EA, because obviously all of you report to someone, but I imagine many of them are not utilizing you to the capacity you have available. Like James said, they're not unleashing your power um, I think that's kind of how you worded it. So yeah, that, yeah. again, it, I forgot to mention this was this book was James' idea. James is the one who said we need to talk to executives. They need to know why EAs are important and how to utilize this person. So I'm um, sorry I forgot to to say that, and that's important. It was his idea as an executive. Um, so, anyways. 
Ms. Jones, uh, let me jump in real quick. I yeah. envisioned, I envisioned when you and I started talking about this book, I envisioned an executive assistant and an executive or an executive team sitting down with our book and, and doing a book reading club with it. Like a, like a course outline for a, a graduate level MBA class where they could go through the book and say, have we built our relationship the way we should? Or let's say you have a new virtual assistant, a virtual EA, and you, you need something foundational to talk about around your relationship and strengthen your relationship. I envisioned our book being a useful tool to guide that conversation. It's an otherwise uncomfortable conversation when you're starting to build a relationship and you're trying to... Um, show how you can be useful to an executive and to accelerate that trust building and relationship building, our book could be used as a syllabi or a syllabus to, to, to drag that forward with a little bit of uh, organization and order. And so for I, I saw a couple of comments and that's why I'm saying this is I saw a couple of comments that said, hey, I don't have that relationship with my executive. Hey, how do I build that? It's hard to connect with them. He, he or she is standoffish, not easy to approach, not easy to build a personal relationship. I'm not saying you need to be friends, but if you have this book and you go chapter by chapter and say, hey, let's read this before our next meeting next week, one chapter at a time, you can use those chapters as conversation starters and dive into the trust building and dive into the, the utilization, effective utilization of the executive assistant and the strategic partner. Ultimately, by the time you finish the book, it's my hope that you're considered a partner that they can't do without that, that, that really should be the case. That's really good insight. And I just made some notes, James, and really quick. Um, the, the other comment to build on that, we, we wrote this book, we're speaking for you. Like James said, we realize that some of your managers are not open. They don't, whatever, they're not going to have the conversation. That's why we're telling them as executives, executives to executives, we tell them in plain old language, this is what you got to do. So if you're afraid to have that conversation, we wanted to have the conversation for you. So if you if you get the book, the whole idea is to give it to them to read and the message is coming from us. But I love, I really love your idea, James. And you just made me think of something that I truly might pursue is that we, I should do a book club webinar series where we have managers and the assistants come on and we host sessions with this book. If any of you are interested in that idea, let me know. I think it would be cool to have us kind of coach and walk you through something like that if you're not sure how to do it. But James mapped it out. All right, let's go on because this is for you. Um, number five, adding the personal touch. Uh, I view this, you are the edge when you add the personal touch. So I know for me, I'm a red communication style person. I'm direct, I'm to the point. I'm kind of matter of fact. A lot of times I don't have time to get all mushy and you know, whatever <laughs> and build the fluff. But my EA, you know, I expect can take my message and soften what I'm saying. So I, I just want to say to her, Malia, this is it, straightforward. Now you go fix it and make it sound wonderful and nice and professional and courteous and warm. So adding that personal touch, I think is very, very important. Um, and James, I know you talk about this. Yeah, the you know, the, the personal touch is, is critical. Look, I'm, I'm a civil engineer by education, um, black and white type decision maker. Uh, my, my significant other, she constantly says, there's no gray area with you. And, and there's a, an element of truth to that in that my brain has been trained. It probably was like this when, as a child as well, but my brain has been further trained because when things fail in my world, people die, right? It, it's that serious. I'm in a life safety engineering kind of industry. And when we don't do a design properly, people can die. Millions of dollars are lost. Um, it's catastrophic failure. And so there's no room for gray area. However, that doesn't always work when you're dealing with humans, because with humans, there is almost always a gray area. And so um, over time, I've encouraged my strategic partner to help me with that. 
soften things up for me. Watch for the things that I'm going to miss. My brain is not going to recognize that maybe somebody's having a rough day. Maybe there's something going on that they're not saying. A lot of times there's body language that I don't pick up on. And Kayla will say, hey, did you see that person fidget in their seat? Get real uncomfortable when you were talking about X, Y, Z. And and that's helpful. Another thing that proactively a strategic partner can do for their executive is get out and soften messages that are not being well received and bring that that dialogue back to the executive when it wouldn't hit their desk otherwise. So a lot of times I'll send out a message, whatever it is, it's not well received or may not be, but no one has the, I'll call it courage, or but maybe it's they don't feel it's their place to bring it back to me and say, hey, that was a poorly crafted message. It wasn't well received. Did you mean something else? My executive assistant can pick that up and has the responsibility, not just the authority, but the responsibility to bring that back to my desk so that I can reevaluate that two way communication where otherwise it might have only been a one direction piece of communication. Yeah. Um, and one quick thing I saw a note, Charity Miller, you're saying I'm not good at fluff. So the only the only thing I want to say to that, though, Charity, <laughs> I get it as an EA. EAs, too, maybe aren't good at, um, and I don't know, not fluff. It's, it's just adding that personal touch to things. I would just say, though, as an EA, and this is another, this is another training program, is EAs do have to apply emotional intelligence when they're dealing with an array of people and being the liaison for the executive and the company. So maybe look into a little bit of working on that a little of in your own little ways, how can you add a little personal touch or be more cognizant, you know, what's going on. But thank you for sharing that with us. Um, number six, we love this one. So six out of 10. Be the information flow manager. I love this one. Love, love, love it. I've talked about this for years. I know we have a visual in the book. I should have flagged that page. But, oh, gosh, there, there is so much information coming in, as James said, to your executives from all aspects. It's just huge. And, you know, the two parts of this. One is your executives aren't using you as the information flow manager. Basically, they get all this information from out there, and a lot of times they deal with it themselves. But when you have a good partnership, that executive takes a lot of what they're absorbing, pushes it over, shares it with their EA, then the EA is that flow manager, and they determine what is going to be done with it. This is a really important role for you. And, and in fact, I'm, I'm updating our Star Achievement Series right now to launch next year. And I am going to spend a, a whole chapter on an EA as the flow manager, the man of information. Um, so James, I want you to go ahead and, and have the uh, time for this one. Yeah, so I think this is one of the tectonic shifts in, in kind of the world that we are living in after the past couple of years. And I love the graphic that you that you have, Joan, where it shows the actual funnel. Uh, but one problem with that graphic is that it's not short enough and it's not wide enough. It, the, the actual amount of information that we capture and have coming in at us as executives is so much broader than the page of a book can show. It's coming, around, coming at us 360 degrees from hundreds of channels. It could, it, you know, it could be team members. It could be internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, investors, board of directors, uh, partners, uh, team members, clients. I mean, it's coming at us a thousand miles an hour from 360 degrees. The only effective way that I have found to capture the valuable parts of that communication are running it through my strategic partner. I have to because they pick up, a good strategic partner will pick up the, the information that rhymes. They will help filter what's important and what's not. They will help you prioritize on what needs to be dealt with on a uh, and now basis, you know, I love that the term ASAP has become just commonplace for our for our 
for our world. Uh, unfortunately, because it's been used so much, ASAP has been diluted. It doesn't mean anything anymore. ASAP could mean, do you need it now? Like, like tweet something like right now to the world? Or is ASAP like within this quarter of the fiscal year? It, it just doesn't mean anything anymore. And so by making sure we understand what that funnel looks like and running that information through our strategic partner, you can effectively, as an executive, digest the information, capture the prioritization, map out the action that needs to come out the other side of that funnel and go be effective in your in your role. But without bringing that together in a really short period of time, that short funnel I mentioned, it needs to be shorter because people expect information from us faster and decisions from us faster. Without that effective uh, flow manager, you know, I just don't understand how anybody could think they could do it all by themselves in this day and age with this much data, with this much communication coming at us full speed. So here, thank you, Kayla. Um, I don't know how much you folks could see, but anyways, it, just to give you a quick of what the funnel kind of looks like, where your executives getting information. And like James said, you can't even fit it on one page. It should flow through you. It does not. A lot of executives are managing their own things um, and handling everything. But the idea is, again, this is why we're saying in this book, hey, you need a funnel everything through your um, EA, your assistant. And that's why you folks can't do your job as effectively today because you're out of the loop. You are, you are out of the loop. You know, when I was an assistant, every single thing crossed my desk before it got to my executive. So I think that's your challenge today. You know, and I feel for you, you, you need to be able to get this information. Um, it's so important. So, um, all right, I guess we got to move on. It's 1041 already. Oh, my gosh. Um, all right. Uh, number seven, being the sounding board. So James alluded to that. So you know you are that edge when, like James said, sometimes we just need to vent and we just need you to listen. Um, and so how many of you, and I guess on that other side, an ex a leader, has to feel comfortable knowing they can just vent to you and it's not going to go any further or you're not going to walk out and say, oh my gosh, my executive is losing it. They have no idea <laughs> they're losing it. They're out of control. But instead, I know one of the great things Malia does for me, she's very in tune now after six years and she'll come in and say, what's going on? She said, you don't seem quite yourself. And then it gives me that opportunity to say, you know, here's what's going on in my head. You know, I have more ideas for us than the bandwidth we have to do something, you know, that I want to bring to life. I mean, it could be whatever, or I could say, oh, well, here's what's going on, you know, at home or something's happening. So I think that to be a sounding board, one, to me, be open, be that sounding board, know that your executive does not always need an answer. Um, instead, what we talk about an emotional intelligence is saying, oh, James, you know, I, I, I kind of, I can understand how you might feel that way. Or just, it's just acknowledging their feelings, I think. Um, and again, not necessarily feel like you have to provide an answer. Um, and I think to be that sounding board to your executive has to trust you. You know, I know it's something I build up as I build a relationship as to, can I feel free to use my admin as my sounding board? Because as leaders, we have no one else we can go to. I mean, I could probably call James and, and dump on him, but he's a busy executive, you know, he's got things to do. So who do we go to? Yeah, yeah, and, and you look, one of the things that I think executives do that's unfair uh, to their strategic partners is just dump on them. I think that's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not fair and it's not right. However, it is the fact of the matter, right? Because a good mentor of mine uh, when I was younger said that you can't complain downward. And, and, and the reason you can't complain downward, what he meant by that was in the organization that picks up momentum and can be detrimental to the organization. So if you're at the top of the organization and you can't complain downward, what do you do? So like Ms. Joan, you and I met in a CEO advisory organization where we met regularly and we could talk about those things 
to people who cared and understood our positions. That same uh, type of relationship is what you can build with your executive assistant your, between the executive assistant and the executive. Um, one thing that is important, though, and I encourage each of you to try this with your executive. The executive should say, hey, I'm not looking for a decision. I just need to vent. Or, hey, I just need you to be my sounding board on this. Let me bounce some things off of you. I'm still just processing. They should verbalize their intent in the conversation. Sometimes I'll go to Kayla and just say, I just need to say this out loud because I feel a little crazy right now. I just need to say this out loud. And I'm not asking you to tell me whether I'm crazy or not. I'm going to assume already that I am. So I just need to say this out loud and get it off my chest. And she'll say, okay, go for it. And I know that she's a steel trap. So it'll go in. She'll take it. She may or may not process it. Process it. She might think to herself, gosh, she's crazy. That's okay. She keeps it to herself. And, and then we just move on. I say, ah, oh, I feel much better now. Thank you for that. Please, you know, put that in your, your mental trash can. And I appreciate you being here for that. But they, the, the executive should say that. And if they don't, you can prompt that from them. You can say, do you, do you need my, are you asking for my advice? Are you asking for my input? Or am I just here to hear you? And, uh, and, and if you say, look, I'm good with it. I, I just want to know what you need from me right now to support you. Uh, that's a great way to, to make sure that you're not just getting mistreated or taken advantage of being the, 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 the you know, emotional, intelligent one in the relationship and just getting dumped on unfairly. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, James. All right, number eight, we've got about like three minutes left because I definitely want to leave time for those questions. I know there's good questions in here. So we'll just, we'll highlight these quickly. Um, you know, soft softening the blow. We kind of talked about that in a way of where uh, as the assistant, you refine some of the communications um, that we may be, uh, for our messages that we want to send. But let's go to number nine, being the calm in the storm. That's one way you definitely provide the edge. Uh, as executives, we live in very chaotic, you know, spaces. But also, I will say the last two and a half years, so have you. We've all been in very uncertain, volatile times. But the one thing I really value is when I have an assistant who is pretty even keel and can be that calm while I'm trying to, you know, figure things out. So James, can you talk about that one? Our world is chaos. I mean, that, that's really all there is to it, right? I mean, I'm afraid to go back and look at my email after this webinar just to, because of the amount of chaos that I expect to see in there. And the, it just so happens that Kayla's on vacation right now and I'm trying to not, you know, bomb her with my chaos so, so she can recharge. But um, normally, you know, she is someone that I can throw a thousand things at, pure chaos, and she can take that and organize it and doesn't get wound up. Because I have to live in the moment, the here and the now, she also points out that I need time to think. And she will calendar that for me and she will make sure that I understand uh, that I need time to process and recover from a from a crazy trip day, week, whatever. And so a good strategic partner should be the calming effect in the otherwise chaotic world. Mm -hmm. You should not you should not add stress to your executive's life. You should not be another piece of chaos. You should really try and strive to be the calming force inside of that relationship or that executive team. And so if you are someone who gets easily wound up or easily spun up, I think seasoning experience will help you start to settle and calm down. Just be very cognizant of your own emotions in that. How do you feel when that information and chaos is coming at you? And just know that that executive, whether they say it or not, needs you to be a calming force in their daily professional lives. Thank you. Awesome. 
Um, really, really quick. Uh, Tina Cox, I see you've been, you've had the book in your Amazon cart for a while waiting for the price to go down. Well, I do have good news at the end of this webinar because we're actually going to give 20% off um, the price of the book as a special for you guys today. But we'll get to that after, but I wanted while I saw your note. Okay, and the number 10, really, really important. You've got to teach your executive how to work with you. I mean, for you to be their edge, uh, or yeah, well, you both need the edge, okay? The idea is you've got to teach your executive how to work with you. They don't always know. And I think like James' idea of taking the book and you go through it together and teaching them. And you also have to learn together as well. But James, go ahead, give your one minute take on that one, teaching your executive how to work with you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're the broken ones. We're the ones that need training. Um, there are there, there are resources out there, uh, executive type trainings. But at the end of the day, no executive likes being told what to do. That's that's why they became leaders. It's part of the the burning underlying desire, the burning in the belly that they want to be in charge of their own destiny and don't want to be told what to do. We know everything, right? Because we know everything. Sure, uh, but you can uh, advertently and inadvertently train your executive. They want you to do it. They won't say that. But books like this, um, other resources, bringing Miss Joan in to help teach. She does that as a as a service. Um, those types of exercises and, and teamwork uh, can train an executive to become more effective. When you have an effective EA and you have an effective executive, you, you form a strategic partnership, you become the executive's competitive edge. Unfortunately, it's not called the executive assistant's competitive edge. Joan can teach you the rest of that in one of her many other books or courses, but the executive needs you so that he or she can be that competitive edge. I'm just putting a note in here. <laughs> Uh, purchase book. I'm telling people where to go a minute. And I know Brian's going to put the link up, but it, it's not, you're going to go to the uh, exec, the uh, Edge website page for that. Um, all right. So anyways, uh, this is great. And those of you are very happy about the discount on the book. So for that, you want to go to executivesedgebook.com. Um, and that we have a website for the book. So, all right, let's go to questions. Malia, I saw some amazing questions in there. Um, there are lots oh. of questions. Um, you wanted me to remind you, though, that we're... Oh, we're giving two books away really quick. Okay, we are. Uh, all right, hurry, hurry. Two books. Quickly, quickly okay. Um, the two winners of the book are Falana Cook and Rosalind Bryant. Okay. Yay. Yay. Okay. I will reach out to you via email after the webinar. Okay, we have some really good questions here. Um, uh, Mary would like to know, how do you keep your manager from scheduling meetings or offering time to meet with people when his schedule is completely booked? You cannot. You cannot stop them from doing it. I do it. But what you should do, instead of trying to strive to change the behavior of an executive, which is very, very difficult, over time, they can uh, maybe. But what is better is if you build a relationship based on the communication to it, when they do it, they bring it back to you. Then you have to build in the prioritization. Which meeting is more important because you have two scheduled? Which one would you like me to do? They, the executive has to bring that back to the funnel. Again, going back to that, to that image of the funnel, you're the flow manager. If the executive assistant doesn't have that information, they cannot effectively be the flow manager. So build the relationship based on trust and communication, such that the executive realizes that it causes more chaos than it's worth. And instead says, hey, I'll get back to you. We really need to meet up. Our relationship is very important. We need to spend time together soon. I agree with you. However, let's get with my strategic partner who manages my calendar so that I am prioritized where I need to be when I need to be there. That has to happen over time. But don't try to stop them from ever doing it. I'm in my calendar every single day. I feel horrible when I do it. But immediately I circle back to Kayla and say, I just did this. I probably screwed something up. Can, can, can I count on you to help me fix it? <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, this young lady wrote a message and said, um, thank you very much for this webinar. And she has an issue where her executive slash manager tells her, she is complicating his life. She has no value to him. 
and she's not adding value to the company, but doesn't tell her why. Do you have any suggestions how she can handle that? Yeah, so it's my advice is that it's time for a pretty tough, candid conversation. If you were to have the conversation and say, I want to add value, my goal in my daily uh, work to, is to support you and to help you. And I want to be a calming effect in your life and not chaos. Help me do that. What are the five things? What are the three things? What are the 10 things I can do to become those things for you? That, that's where I would start. And if they're unwilling to invest that conversation in you, then you have other decisions to make, obviously. But starting there, and I, I would think a responsible executive would hear that. And if they feel like you're telling the truth, that you really want to be the calming effect in their life and provide value to the organization and to their lives, and they truly believe that in their heart of hearts, um, I, I believe they will sit down and it might be the, the most impactful conversation you've had to date. That's great. Great, great. Okay. Um, let's see. Harpreet says, how do you deal with the situation when one of the executives indicates that you will be hitting the ceiling in regards to salary band and should start thinking different about your career? What do you do in that case? And how do you tell them that this is my career and I am striving to bring value? Yeah. So, I, I think that happens to a lot of us, right? I, I'm When I was a civil engineer by by trade, meaning I was doing engineering every day, I eventually hit a, a uh, kind of a ceiling. And it wasn't until I went into management that I was able to get past that. And it wasn't until I went into executive management that I was able to get past that. And it wasn't until I got to partnership to get past that. So I would say one, I would say a few things. The first is no one gets to define your ceiling but you. You get to define your own ceiling, not somebody else. Whether that's inside your organization, outside your organization, whatever. You decide what ceiling you're willing to allow to be placed on you, and you decide to blow through it or to uh, embrace it, and that is the, the pinnacle of where you want your career to be. The second is, uh, I like to stay in the questions. So ask the question, how do I get to a position where that's not my ceiling? How do I continue to add value where that's not the case? and let them talk. Maybe a chief of staff role is coming up in a couple of years and you could focus on that. Maybe a chief operations officer, COO or operations director role is coming up and you could point towards that. Maybe they, they want you to get an MBA so you understand more of the nuances of the business, additional education. I, I just think there's a lot of options out there. And if you anchor in your heart that your glass, your ceiling is your ceiling to own and not theirs, I think you can overcome that if you've got the desire to keep growing. Wow, that was really insightful. Really? Thank you. Yeah. Sure. I never thought of it that way. I'm taking a hundred, I've got a bunch of notes about what you're saying. I, I actually caught myself leaning in on that one. <laughs> got him. Um, Rodina, hello Rodina, would like to know regarding email access, um, she would like your own opinion as an executive. I have uh, five email accounts and my executive assistant has access to one of them. Um, and it is it is kind of the, the highest level of account that really only she and I communicate through functionally. And it's my investment account. So it's, it's the email account where my partnership, my legal documents, accounting files, things, the highest level of trust that she and I communicate through. The rest of them I manage. And I, and I handle. And the main reason is because it, frankly, it's not worthy of her attention until I say so, right? I, I'm the one that has to make sure that our goals, our, our planning, our communication stays concise and crisp. Mostly, I don't want to bomb her with garbage and email. Some people use it like a text message. I'd rather not bomb her with that. But it is my obligation and my responsibility for our relationship to bring that information back to her. Right. If, if I want her to be the flow manager, I have to get that information to her. Uh, and so I don't have her manage my Hotmail account that I've had since I was 15. Right. Hotmail's I don't, it, it's barely even a thing. But there, there's no need for there's no need for that. It's not appropriate. 
But if the, if I get the one email a month in that email account that she needs to see, I send it to the one email address that she monitors for us. Awesome. Wow. So let's see, Malia, we're at, gosh, one minute left. I know. Um, I know. And there's so many good questions. Uh, yeah. if, if everybody could hang on for just a, like two more minutes. Um, I know we'll go, we, I definitely will look at the chat. Malia always captures all of that. And I'm uh, really curious to see the other questions we got. Maybe those are some things. Maybe there's a part two webinar. I don't know. But anyway, um, I just want to quickly thank James. As you could see, he's just, you know, brilliant and kind and wonderful and very approachable and understanding. So thank you, James, very, very much um, for more great insight. And uh, I know you helped a lot of assistants out there for sure. Well, it's, and, really been, it's been my pleasure, uh, Joan, working with you is lovely and working with your team and your followers is really exciting and fun. I've enjoyed being able to uh, hopefully create impact um, and uh, offer kindness to, to the world. Um, and I saw a couple of fellow hockey fans, so I'll end with Go Knights Go. VGK team, Go Knights Go. Can I, just, can I just throw out there, we did get a comment from Linda, Linda Carroll, who was at our conference. Yes. Um, she said, my executive accepted the book graciously, and I've noticed that he's giving me more to stretch myself and assist him. This is just since returning from the conference, and it's going to continue. Thank you both. Wow. Yes. Woohoo! Yes. That's what we want to hear. That's what we want to hear. All right, really, really quick, a couple of announcements because more exciting things are coming up. So really quick, um, November 10th, actually next week, I'm doing a webinar on build an illustrious career that might help prep you for 2023. Our big annual tradition, 12 Deals of Christmas, starts December 1st. So we're going to have big discounts on a lot of our courses for 2023. And with that, on December 1, I'm going to do our annual tradition webinar called It's a Wrap, W-R-A-P. Our Star Achievement course is going to start in January. That's our, our flagship training program. It is a designation program. World Class is going to uh, start up in the spring. We've got conference on the man. We have all kinds of goodies for you. Um, just because we love you. So thank you all so much for being a part of today. I think this was a fascinating conversation. And maybe we'll start a book club for you guys. I don't know. James and I will have to talk on the side about that. <laughs> all right. Bye, everyone. Take bye, care. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.